The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn series. We're up to Unit 2 today. Um, welcome wherever you are. I just want to do a sound check because we had a few issues on Friday, and I just want to make sure that I am being heard. So could I just ask you to go to the question box just on the right-hand side and type in the word clear if it's coming across loud and clear because obviously that's important so let's have a look clear thanks rebecca thanks nick thanks amy thanks john welcome mark okay brilliant okay yeah look i apologize for friday um well not much i could have could have done about it. It's just one of those things that, uh, unfortunately, we had some internet issues. But anyway, we're we're in. Uh, we look like we might be uh, launching away successfully. So thank you for uh, taking the time this morning. So I really want to talk about the five conversations framework today. And um, a lot of you would be thinking, well, I understand I've got to have these check-ins with people, but I'm not quite sure what I should be talking about. And so therefore, what I've done is I've given you a framework or I will give you a framework here that I know works extremely well. I know that because we've applied this in lots of organisations. In fact, some organisations are using this as a replacement for the performance review. Now, if your organisation thinks that there's some value in that, then uh, talk to me offline about that and I can talk to you at a, at a, um, in a little bit more detail about how that might occur. All right, so let's launch into today's topic. Um, as you can see on your screen, we are up to the second unit. Um, so I hope you've had a chance to practice some of the attributes of authentic conversations we discussed in the last, sec last uh, session a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I hope you found that useful. So I won't launch into talking about the other four units we're covering because we'll do that in due course. So let's get stuck into today's topic. I actually want to talk about uh, three things today. I want to talk about the concept of the five conversations framework. And what I really want to talk about is why it's effective and give you some heads up as to why that would be the case. I'll actually, of course, explain the five conversations framework. I'll, I'll explain the application of it as well. But ultimately, it's really a an opportunity to have a really valuable check in. Now, you might ask the question, well, how often should I have these check ins? And it's a good question. I guess it depends on the number of direct reports you've got that that's obviously useful to know that but uh, because obviously the more you have the more time it's going to take um, but I would suggest that two three or four weeks would be the optimum so uh, look towards having those regular check-ins now these check-ins don't have to be you know an hour long each and in fact I would recommend that they're not an hour long each I'd suggest they be fairly short no more than 30 minutes, uh, probably 20 minutes would be optimal. But if you're very focused on these questions, then of course it helps. And I will share with you uh, during this uh, broadcast the questions that you can ask during those check-ins as well. All right, so we've um, let's just start with talking about the concept of engagement. Um, you've probably seen many, many surveys that show that up to 70% of people are disengaged at work. Now, um, whether that's 70% or whether it's 75 or whatever it might be, the reality is the surveys consistently show that people are disengaged at work uh, more than they're engaged. And of course, that's an issue because when people are disengaged, um, what it means, of course, is that people aren't necessarily giving of their best. And there's a range of reasons why people are disengaged and, and uh, we'll talk about some of those as well. But ultimately, what I would see is the opportunity to engage more people by involving yourselves in these, uh, these check-ins that I'm talking about as a source of engagement. Now, 
you may say, well, what's the definition of engagement? The truth is um, we all know what engagement is and we all know what disengagement is. Um, if I came into your organisation, for example, tomorrow, if it was possible, and I sat down and just sat in a corner somewhere and I just watched people for 20 minutes interact with each other and how they were going about their work, and then after about 20 minutes, you and I sat down and had a conversation, I will guarantee that we'd both agree on who's engaged and who's disengaged in your workplace. So it's one of those things that you know when you see it. Uh, but here's a formal definition of engagement. So the engaged employees are committed to their work and actively contribute to organisational performance. Now, the other thing about it, engagement is that it'll ebb and flow. So, for example, uh, you know, people may start out uh, engaged and then they have a bad day or a bad week and all of a sudden they become disengaged. It's quite possible during the course of a day for someone to be engaged and disengaged depending on what's occurring at, at the time. So we're talking about a consistent level of engagement or dis, uh, um, of disengagement. So we're talking about that more than the normal uh, you know, interruptions we have in our own engagement in the workplace, and we all experience that, including you and me. It's just part and parcel of life. So we do know from some research, um, and there's more and more research coming out now, which demonstrates that there is a correlation between the level of engagement and performance. Now, it might seem counterintuitive that Obviously, an engaged person is going to be a higher performer, but now we've got some research to demonstrate that. So in the private sector, for example, we do know that when engagement levels go up, we can track uh, revenue as well. So obviously, there's an important reason. I mean, we want people to enjoy their work, but we also want, of course, to be able to achieve the objectives that the organisation wants to achieve. And as a result of that, of course, um, we do know that engagement does increase those levels of, in, of, of productivity as well. So there's obviously a benefit there as well. So there has been some useful research to demonstrate that. Now, what I want to do is share with you some interesting research. Well, I wouldn't call it research. I've been working in lots of organisations and introducing the five conversations across a number of, in fact, across 21 industries. And what I wanted to show you here is how powerful these check-ins can be. So what I, and I'm showing you an organisation that I did some work in um, not too long ago. I won't, exp I won't mention, of course, who it is. But what I do want to share with you is the aggregate results of some surveys that we did in this organisation. And just to demonstrate to you how incredibly powerful these five conversations are in relation to building up a whole range of factors in the workplace. So what you can see on your screen here is two statements. One statement saying that the communication between managers and staff is reasonably good most of the time. Now, the response, the aggregate response we got across the organisation, and we're talking about uh, 350 people here, the aggregate response was genuinely, we agree. And But survey one, and survey one was conducted at the outset before we actually launched into the five conversations framework. But survey one showed that about 50% of people in the workplace felt that there was a reasonably good uh, communication going on between management and team, but probably more evidently, there were 50% of people that thought it wasn't that good. But after five conversations, no more than five, so what happened is that we surveyed people and then we, we got all managers to sit down with their team and conduct the five conversations over a five month period. So it was one conversation a month over five months. And you can see that then we surveyed people again, basically the same survey. We asked the same people the same questions in the same way, which was online. And we found that the, the uh, view about communication between management and staff had gone up from 50 to 77 after five conversations. Now you might say, well, 
that's not surprising if they were involved in five additional conversations they wouldn't normally have. Nevertheless, it's, it's a significant increase. Uh, the second question that we asked is, bosses, uh, my boss has talked to me about ways to improve job satisfaction. Now, uh, initially, we had a response of only 23%. Only 23% believed that their manager took an interest in their own job satisfaction. However, by the end of just five check-ins, that 23% went up to 44%. Now, that's pretty significant. You'd have to agree. Um, let's look at some other results in the survey. One of the statements in the survey was uh, the statement around my boss um, has discussed my strengths and talents with me. So they've actually sat down and as you might be aware that one of the five conversations is about talking about people's strengths and talents. So initially only 43% of people before we did these check-ins uh, said that they believed that their manager sat down and talked to them about these things. But that increased to 72% after five conversations, which is significant. My boss gives me feedback on my strengths and talents. That went from 43 to 61. My boss is very aware of my strengths and talents. Well, that went from 47 to 67. So you can see there's some significantly good results. Now you might say, well, those results aren't sustainable. They're not sustainable unless you continue to have these regular check-ins. I mean, the point is that they're not going to stay at those high levels in survey two, and then you just up, you know, you just abandon the five conversations and that'll stay there. Of course it won't. They're only reporting on what's actually happening at the time. Here's some more results that you might be interested in. Um, one statement is, I have not received enough feedback from my, on my work from my boss. And in this case, 36%, uh, um, you know, that, birch, that doubled. So feedback doubled because by being involved in these uh, check-ins, it was inev inevitable that some feedback would be given. And in fact, some upward feedback was given as well to the boss. I feel my boss is getting the best out of me in my current job. Well, 43% went to 72 after five rounds or, or five uh, check-ins. I've discussed strengths to grow and develop my current role with my boss. Well, that went from 40 to 55. So remember, these are aggregate results. Some of them were even better than that. And of course, some of them weren't as good as that, but ultimately that was the sort of aggregate across the organization. Here are three more. The boss has discussed my learning and development needs with me, 47 to 78. I've discussed my learning and development needs more than once in the last 12 months. Well, initially it was less than 50% and now it's 67. Uh, the learning I'm doing is designed to build my strengths and opportunities for growth went up to 72. Um, my boss has implemented some improvements from his or her team to improve our team's way of doing business went from 43 to 78, which is a positive result. I'm sure you'd agree. Whoop, I went too far there. Um, uh, my boss is open to um, imp improvements, I suggest. Well, 57 to 83, which is a great result. Now, some of the comments that came out, and of course, the, the opportunity was there to, to gather some data from comments that people made about the five conversations framework. And here's a couple of the comments that were made. And you can see there, um, the questions are not intrusive and could be delivered in a friendly manner. They provided an opportunity to learn more about individual team members. The conversations help to break down barriers of communication and enable line managers to have more open conversations with team members. The five conversations framework has fostered more impromptu conversations in the team. In other words, discussions about what team members are working on. So overall, the five conversations framework assisted in improving engagement, trust and relationships of participants. So I guess what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that there is 
not just research out there, um, there's my own work in terms of working with organisations that demonstrate that these five conversations do make a significant impact on uh, people's trust, the relationships they have, uh, their engagement levels, and a whole range of other factors as well. All right, is there anyone got any questions at this stage that they'd like to ask me? If you do, go to the question box and type them in, or if you want to make some comments about what I've gone through, um, please do, because that's the way we keep this as interactive as, as we possibly can. So if you've got any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to receive those. All right, so I, I guess what I want to say here is there are some benefits around these five conversations. And what I want to do is just sum these up. When I've done that, what I want to then do is talk about the five conversations and share with you the framework, share with you how it can be implemented, and also talk about the questions that you can ask during these conversations. All right, so one of the benefits of the five conversations framework is that it creates an on ongoing dialogue, and that's a good thing. In other words, um, by having these regular check-ins with people, you're creating a regular ongoing dialogue. And normally what happens is when we have performance reviews, it's usually once or twice a year and that's it. And the rest of the time, you might recall I talked about is we'll have a lot of uh, conversations about the work that needs to be done, but very few people related conversations. So that's one of the great benefits. Another great benefit is it does encourage openness and directness. And what we found is that, you know, and you can see from the results that I shared with you, is there was lots of positive feedback about how people, um, you know, uh, you know, built better working relationships up with their manager. And that's obviously a very positive thing as well. So uh, it also, we talked uh, that one of the benefits is that there's a greater degree of flexibility um, in the sense that um, obviously uh, we're not just sitting down once or twice a year and having these sort of very formal conversations that we call performance reviews. Um, we are actually doing this on a regular basis. Now, some organisations, as I mentioned before, uh, have used this as actually a replacement for the performance review. Now, others uh, are using it in tandem with the performance review. In other words, they're, they're enabling a better performance review result by, um, by engaging these regular check-ins. Another benefit, of course, is it's timely information. And of course, if you're having a regular check-in once a fortnight, uh, once every three weeks or once a month, then Obviously, you're on top of what's going on at the time. And so instead of waiting until the end of the year or whenever it is, uh, you can deal with it right there and then, which is obviously a good thing. And finally, um, people commented that they found it far more relaxing, uh, you know, because obviously when you're tense and I'm tense, we're not going to have our best conversations. That's the truth. We're going to be very guarded about what we say. We're going to be worried about how we'll come across. But by creating a regular check-in environment, you are creating a far more relaxed um, dialogue between you and the other person. So there are a lot of benefits for you to get together with your team. I'd be interested to know, and you may not, you may want to tell me, you may not. But if you are using regular, are you if you're having regular check-ins with your team members? I'd be interested to know. Share that with <clears throat> share that with me. Let me know what's the big benefit that you're getting out of regular check-ins, and I'd be very happy to pass that on to other people who are who are in this webinar. All right. So I want to now move on to what the five conversations framework actually looks like, and then um, I, then as I said, I'll show you how it's implemented if we were looking at it in a broad scale. But really, if it's just something that you want to implement for yourself, then it's a case that you can go ahead and virtually start that tomorrow. So over on the left hand side, you'll notice that there are five months. And uh, so the argument is that you would have a check in with each individual direct report once a month. 
I don't think that's too onerous. Some people say that's a difficult proposition when they've got lots of direct reports, and it's probably the case. But I think for most of us to be able to sit down with someone and have a 20 minute check in with each direct report once a month, I don't think is onerous. What's more important is that it's an investment of time and you'll find that some of the benefits that I've talked about previously here will actually, you will have those benefits in your five conversations. Uh, so in other words, it's not, it's an exercise of gaining trust, building relationships, improving engagement and improving performance. So if it's going to take an investment of 20 minutes a month with each individual direct report, then that shouldn't be a problem. Now the middle column is the theme. So each of the conversations has a theme around it. And the reason for that is that otherwise we wonder what we're going to talk about. And I think it's great to actually have a theme on a monthly basis. Some people say, well, after I've got through one round, what happens at the end of that? Well, my comment to you would be that you'd go around and do the cycle again. So the, the aim might be to get uh, 10, 20-minute uh, conversations done every year with each indirect with with each direct report, and I think if you could aim for that, then you're going to be in a pretty good position. So we month one we have the climate review conversation, which of course has nothing to do with the weather. So the climate review conversation looks at job satisfaction, morale, and communication. So you're looking at uh, those sorts of things and um, organisations spend uh, thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on engagement surveys that are normally done online. Now, the problem with those engagement surveys is that the level of participation in them tends to drop off over a period of time. And the reason they drop off is pretty straightforward. People actually think, well, nobody really, um, nothing ever happens. I've given this feedback, I've spent half an hour filling out these forms and nothing really happens. And so people think, well, why would I bother to engage uh, in this survey from now on in? My question to you is why wouldn't we just have the regular conversation with each person? Why do we need to have this sort of, uh, once a year engagement survey when we could actually do it face to face. People would often say, well, people may not be honest face to face, which would be a very good reason why we should be having it because clearly if people aren't honest with you in a one-on-one -on -one engagement, then clearly the, the, there is uh, some trust issues there. And if there's some trust issues there, the only way that they're going to be rectified is if you continue to have these five conversations or regular conversations. So the climate review um, is followed by a strengths and talents conversation. So instead of us going straight for the jugular and looking at what people are not good at, it's a good idea to start looking at what people are actually good at. Because we do know that if we look at what people are good at and we can actually create an environment where they can utilize and harness those strengths in their day-to-day -day work, then clearly they're going to be a benefit to the team. So strengths and talents are, uh, you know, and, and look, of course, if you sat down with someone and said, look, tell me what your strengths and talents are, it's probably likely that they're going to give you a, a very strange look. But if you ask people what they enjoy most about their work, it's a good question. So what is it that you enjoy most about your work? Now, hopefully there's something, but... <laughs> Uh, and, and whatever they tell you is probably likely to also be a strength. So because of that, you've got an opportunity then to start to ask them, how could we perhaps build upon that in the current work that you do? So for example, if someone's very good at dealing with customers or clients or stakeholders, and yet their job is very much around, you know, having their head pressed against a computer screen, the question then might be, how can we utilise that skill of yours, that strength, that innate talent, so that you can do more of the work that you're actually quite good at doing? You see, so that's how those sorts of things work. Now, it might well be that nothing can be done. And so if nothing can be done, well, that's fine. At least that's discussed. And if 
And when the opportunity arises where something can be done, we can start looking at that. In month three, we look at the opportunities for growth. Now, the opportunities for growth are very much uh, the other side of the coin. So this is about things that people need to work on. And again, um, I put the onus of responsibility back on the individual. So my question there would be, um, what's one area over the next 12 months that you're looking to work on and improve? And uh, then we're going to have a conversation about that. So instead of me sitting there evaluating someone, how about we get them to actually critique themselves? And so, uh, and by the way, you, I think it's really useful to give people the questions that you're going to ask before you have these conversations. I want people to come to these check-ins who are regularly, who are ready, ready to go. I don't want people to be sitting there blindsided by the questions that I'm asking. I want them to have actually thought through how they might respond to these questions. Now, the learning and development conversation, which happens in month four, is a combination. So you, really, in month two, we've talked about strengths. In month three, we've talked about opportunities for growth. So in month four, we can bring all that together and talk about a learning plan. Now, a learning plan may not necessarily be about sending people off to a, a course. It could well be that you coach people or you, uh, you, know, you give them some... Um, you know, uh, you buddy them up with someone else. It could be around mentoring. So learning and development is much more than just sending someone off to a training course, as valuable as sometimes they, those courses can be. So that's a way of us consolidating all that information that's come out of conversation two and three. Now, the good news there is that, uh, you know, well, organisations spend, again, inordinate amounts of time doing training needs analyses and you know they try and find out what all the needs are for the organization to plan a budget for the following year again i'd ask the question and just like the climate review why don't we just talk about those things why do we have to um, spend all of this time and energy doing a training needs analysis when we could simply talk to people on the spot and we can record that information of course the final conversation where the fourth conversation is about the individual the final conversation is about the workplace. So this is about the way uh, we can make the workplace more efficient and effective. And again, it's not just your responsibility to come up with that. Ultimately, lots of people have got good ideas about how the workplace can be improved. Let's tap into that. So why don't we have a conversation about that? I, I dare say all your organisations and we've got people here from the public sector, the private sector, and not-for-profit, regardless of who you are. Uh, the, the bottom line is there's enormous pressure on you and your organisation to be more efficient and effective. And as a result of that, uh, we need to tap into the resources of the people that we're working with. And that's where conversation number five comes in. So folks, that's a quick overview of the uh, the, the framework, if you like. If there's any questions you'd like to ask me, go to the uh, chat box and type in the message. I'm the only one that'll get it, and I'm happy to respond to it the moment I get it. Now, just to give you a sense of how uh, the five conversations is implemented, now, bear in mind, I'm talking about organisational wide here. Uh, I, you know, I you, as I said to you earlier, you can start using the five conversations framework this afternoon. But if you were looking at building this up across your organisation or across a team in the organisation, here's, here's a strategic approach that you might consider using. You'll notice that there are six steps in the process. And uh, I'll run through those six steps with you uh, very briefly. So let's have a look at the very first step, which is assessing. Now, you might, you, you saw the results of the survey I gave earlier on today, uh, this, you know, earlier on in the webinar. Um, you, it, it sometimes can be very useful to get a before and after snapshot. So we might actually do a survey, which is done online. It's a very simple survey, and it gives us a benchmark to work from. And bear in mind, this is about an organisational wide approach, as again, 
as I said earlier, if it's just you doing this, then you don't need to do this. Um, so what we do is we collect some data, like I showed you before, and that data will give us a benchmark to be able to measure the success of the five conversations against later. The second thing we'd do if we were doing an organisational wide approach is that we would make sure that we'd induct all the managers uh, and all the employees as well so that everybody understands that basically they'd have the same information that you're getting today. So they understand why we're doing it, what the benefits are and how it'll be implemented and what the expectations are of both the manager and the person on the receiving end. Again, if you're doing this one-on-one, -on -one, well, of course you wouldn't need to uh, do this. You just launch into it and do it. Um, we also find, and I've, from my own experience, one thing that's very powerful in organisations is group coaching. Now, group coaching is where you get three or four managers together and you get them to share their experience about whatever it is. And in this case, what it would be would be their experience with the five conversations framework. So what's working, what's not working, and uh, what are you doing differently as a result of that? So we look at that whole uh, issue around that as well. Um, again, of course, if you were doing it one-on-one, -on -one, you, you certainly wouldn't need to go there. And uh, each month there can be broadcasts around each conversation so that each month at the end of each month, because the expectation is that you would do each of these conversations once a month, there'd be a 30 minute webinar which would just, just introduce the, five convers uh, the, the conversation for the month. So if for example, it's strengths and talents, what are the questions that are going to be asked? Why is the conversation important? What do we expect to get out of it? can be an approach that we use. The implementation of the conversations framework is actually the learning. A lot of people think that I've got to learn to have conversations before I do. The best way to go about this is just to dive in and do it uh, and learn from it and uh, think about it. Uh, there's also an opportunity, um, again, if you're doing this one-on-one, -on -one, you wouldn't need it, but organisationally, people often say to me, well, how do we record the results of these five conversations? That what about the actual having sort of some sort of a record? Well, we have an online um, uh, web-based management support system that can be used for that. But of course, that's not relevant unless, of course, you're thinking beyond your team. And then, of course, the next, the last cycle is that we assess people like I did before after five rounds and you undoubtedly will get a very good handle on how you're actually going. So I just make the point if you, if, and we've got varying uh, seniorities of managers in this uh, webinar. Uh, if you're looking at doing this in your own department, of course, talk to me um, offline about it. But of course, if you're doing this one-on-one, -on -one, just go and start and, and uh, you'll find it will work extremely well for you, I'm sure. So let me now turn to the questions that you can ask. And remember, you'll get a copy of these slides. In fact, um, there is a copy of these slides uh, already on the learning platform. So you just have to go to the learning platform and you'll find the slides. I'll obviously upload the uh, YouTube video that uh, will be accompanying that as well. This is what we're doing now, which is the recording. So I'll upload the upload this this afternoon and you'll have a copy of that as well. But uh, there's two essential questions that you need to ask in that very first conversation, which is the climate review conversation. The first question is, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, one being low, how do you rate your current job satisfaction? Now we know these things ebb and flow depending on what's going on at the time. But by asking people to give you a number, you're actually, uh, it's a little less confronting than just saying to someone, how's your job satisfaction? And then you get a fairly vague sort of response. But if somebody says, oh, I'd rate it a five, then obviously you can then ask them the question, um, why, did you, why did you rate it that? And then get some sense of where they're at. Um, and a five for them, it might be actually a good result. Um, the number itself is not so much of a, 
important issue here. The really the important value of this conversation is really around the second question about why did you give it this rating? That's where you'll get some great benefit because obviously that person then can open up a little bit, talk about what they like and don't like about the work that they're doing with you and with the organisation. That's a good thing. Um, you're going to hear things in these check-ins that you hadn't heard before. You'll be quite surprised. It'll confirm things you already knew and it'll perhaps surprise, thing, surprise you about some things you didn't know. So there it is. Uh, that's why I say you won't need more than 20 minutes in these conversations because it's an opportunity to get together and have a discussion which is fairly straightforward and you'll find that all the conversations are designed to be short, sharp and to the point. Now with the strengths and talents conversation, remember that's conversation two, uh, there are three key questions that you can ask. Question one is, what are the tasks you enjoy doing most in your current job? Remember I, I indicated where well, there's a high correlation between what people actually enjoy and what they're good at. So ask people what they enjoy. And then you can ask them, why do they enjoy those sorts of tasks? So it gives you an opportunity to explore that a little bit further with them. And then in your current role, how can we work together to provide you with the opportunity to do more of this? All right, now, as I said before, it may not be possible at the current time, but that's fine. At least there's an understanding there. But who knows what the future might hold and there may be an opportunity where you can build on those. And I'm not talking about taking someone out of a job and putting them in another job, although that's possible. It's more around how they might utilise those tasks, uh, those skills, uh, strengths, um, more so in the current work that they're doing. Now, conversation three, which is essentially the conversation around opportunities for growth, again, has only three questions. And, you know, you don't have to read these questions off, obviously. They're very clear and simple to ask. But as I said to you earlier, I think it's important that you give people a heads up on what you're going to talk about in these conversations. One, it's courtesy. Secondly, it gives them an opportunity to start to think about their own responses so that when they get to you, it should be hopefully a richer dialogue because they've actually given it some thought. So what's one area that you believe you have an opportunity for growth and what would it be? So if people come to that conversation with uh, a clear area, this is good. You may disagree with that area. There's no reason why you can't, of course, uh, respectfully disagree. Or perhaps you could say that I think there's some other things that we're going to work on. But the point is you're opening up the dialogue and building up the trust levels. You're getting on the same page as the other person, which is ultimately what this is about. So the second question could be, can you elaborate on this so that I understand what you mean? So, you know, I think it's important to do this because otherwise what's going to happen is that you'll just jump to assumptions about what the person's on about. So I think it's very important for you to explore that a little bit further with the person. Um, and then, of course, you might ask, what can we, you notice the word we, what can we do to improve this performance? Now, of course, ultimately the performance is up to the individual to improve, no question. But you're there as their leader, so it's quite possible that there's things that you can do that might assist with that growth. And, and performance. So that's why you're using the word we in that last question. Now conversation four is the learning and development conversation. Remember I talked about the fact that conversation two and three was about building on strengths and opportunities for growth. And instead of spending too much time in those conversations talking about ways and means of moving forward and, and developing strengths and overcoming weaknesses, it's probably best to have a dedicated conversation to that, which is ultimately what conversation four is about. So it also gives people a chance to go away and reflect on those two conversations. And again, if people get these questions beforehand, they're in a position where they can have actually give it some thought. 
So the first question here is based on our previous two conversations, what learning and development opportunities will assist you to build on the strengths and assist you with the opportunities for growth? So again, the onus of responsibility here with these check-ins is on the other person to explain to you what they intend to do or what they think they should do based on the conversations that we've had. And that, that means that they, they become responsible for their own performance, they become responsible for their own development. And then of course you may say, well, how can I help? Because there may well be things that you can do to help that person um, instead of just launching in with some suggestions, ask them how you can help. Try to get some sort of clarity around that. Um, because there probably are things, as I said, you can do that can make a difference there. Now, conversation five looks a bit complicated, but it's not really. There's only one question for conversation five. And the conversation question is this. What suggestion do you have to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our workplace? Now, I suggest you focus and target in on your own immediate workplace rather than across the organisation. Uh, because, look, if, if, as I said earlier, if everybody in the organisation is doing the five conversations, and there are many organisations that are, then uh, you're going to get lots of suggestions from various people across the organisation on a range of issues. Now, to prompt some help with this, because if you just said to people, what suggestions have you to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the organisation, they might just give you a blank look. So uh, here are some prompters. How could we improve quality? That is the quality of the work we do. How can we improve the, the management of the time we take to do the work that we do? If it's an outdoor team, how can we increase the safety of the job? How can we increase our own productivity? What ways can we save costs? Which will, of course, moving forward after, uh, over, after, the, after COVID-19, obviously this is going to be a a seriously important issue, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector or not for profit. How can we meet deadlines more effectively? Because all organisations and all every individual has deadlines to meet. So how can we meet them more effectively? How can we improve our cooperation with other teams? You know, there might be stakeholders or other teams where the productivity is not particularly good. So what can we do to improve it? And how might we improve the systems and the processes that we use in order to do our work? Now, uh, there's plenty there. Now, we, do, we only want people to come to that conversation with one suggestion. But what you're doing here is you're giving people an opportunity to consider a range of issues that might, they might want to talk about. So it prompts them to think outside the box, if you like. Um, and again, I don't want people to come to these conversations sitting there blankly thinking I haven't really given it much thought. We actually want people to think about them. So email them the statements or the questions beforehand so that by the time they get to you, they've given this some thought. And you're likely to have a far better dialogue than you would if otherwise. And of course, there's no excuse then, is there? If the person's got the questions, then they've got to give it some thought. So folks, that's the five conversations. Are there any questions that people have got that they might like to ask me about the process? Whether you do it individually, of course, I'm suggesting that you do it individually. Um, there's no, you don't have to use the five conversations, but I guess what I'm trying to do in this second unit is to give you a basis, uh, if you like, a platform, a framework, to start to think about what, how you might have conversations with people around the people related type conversations that we've been talking about earlier. But uh, what the homework that I want you to do, and remember we, we meet fortnightly, um, so when we come back for unit three, I'd like to think that your homework is that you'd implement a monthly check-in so if you're not already doing it, then start it. And if you are already doing it, then I'd like you to continue it, perhaps 
improve it somewhat by using some of the ideas that come out of today's webinar. And of course, I'm suggesting you might like to use the five conversations framework um, because it's the one I, I developed and, uh, I, and I know very well. And I, I also know, of course, that it works extremely well. All right, so any questions, folks, before we wrap up? You're a quiet bunch today. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping that's just because you're being very thoughtful, you know, you're being thought, very thoughtful about how you might apply this. All right, so um, now if you've got any question, now in your learning platform, there is some information about the five conversations. So you've got things in there that are useful for you. So go to your learning platform and how you get in is very simple. You just, um, you, I'll, I'll be sending you out an email this afternoon again. You'll get, uh, you just put, uh, you know, you type in, you obviously click on the link and then your, uh, your name, username, if you like, is your email address, the one that you've sent me and your, the uh, password is welcome with a capital W, 20 with no space in it. That will take you into your portal. Uh, you'll be able to view lots of things there as well. So I just noticed we've got a few sound issues at the moment, so it's probably quite timely I uh, finish up. I just turned off the webcam just to give us a chance to make sure that I can finish up what I'm doing. So next time we meet, we're going to talk about coaching and I'm going to talk about the GROW model with you and give you a very good heads up on how that might work. So folks, that's it from me. So thank you for the opportunity of working with you today um, and uh, look forward to hearing of your success around the five conversations framework. Um, remember, I'm always available on email at any time if you would like to, to discuss that with me. And if you want to talk about organising the five conversations across your department, then let me know. So thanks everyone. We'll catch up in a fortnight. Uh, have a fantastic week. And again, I apologise about the problems we had on Friday, but I think we're probably uh, in good shape now. So thank you. See you in a fortnight. All the very best. Thank you and goodbye.